Hello and welcome back to another lesson. Now within this lesson, what I wanted to do was to offer you five top quotes to memorize when it comes to the character of Macbeth. In other words, what I want to offer are if you forget everything else was in the play when writing about Macbeth's character, these are the five quotations and the accompanying themes as well as context points you can make when analyzing and writing about these quotations from Macbeth, considering how he goes from at the beginning of the play being very loyal to King Duncan, he lets his wife and the witches corrupt him and then by the end he's a shadow of his former self, he is a tragic hero. Let's start with the first quotation which I believe is a really powerful quotation which illustrates his initial innocence, his initial loyalty to King Duncan, but equally how the seeds of ambition had already been planted by the witches. In Act 1, Scene 4, he says, Stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. He says this once he learns that he's Thane of Cordor. So once the first prophecy of the witches comes true, that he's going to be promoted from Thane of Glams to Thane of Cordor. And we can see that he's really tussing, he's having this inner conflict. And this inner conflict, when you're now doing some word level analysis, this inner conflict is emphasized through the use of personification here, where Macbeth is begging the stars to hide this ambition. He's embarrassed, he's ashamed to want to have more power and to ultimately maybe be a king. Equally, when he uses the juxtaposition, it's not oxymoron, okay? The opposite words, these are not direct opposites, but they are fairly contrasting, okay? He juxtaposes the idea of light, the idea of truth, the idea that King Duncan is the rightful king with the notion that he has these black desires, right? And the use of the juxtaposition of these two terms is really powerful once more in showing that Macbeth at this stage is not corrupted completely by ambition but he's having this inner conflict. He wants to become, to, to explore the possibility of not only becoming Thane of Cordor, but especially King hereafter, right? And the final thing to consider is when he talks about his deep desires. And alliteration here emphasizes once more this ongoing conflict. And of course, remember that this inner conflict and this inner turmoil resolves itself when he finally decides to follow what his wife says, and he takes the evil decision to kill King Duncan. Now, this quotation is really powerful because firstly you can use it to talk about how Macbeth was a good guy and he felt some guilt. In terms of the themes that you can relate it to, firstly, it this uh, quotation directly falls under the theme of ambition. The, the reason why it falls under the theme of ambition is we can see that Macbeth is starting to grow increasingly ambitious. He's starting to wonder what it's like to be king, what it's like to amass more power, what it's like to rise in the great chain of being and to rise from being a knight, a servant of King Duncan, to actually becoming a powerful man. And of course, this is something, especially through personification, which he really, really struggles with. He almost wants to hide even this independent thought. Of course, also, this ties into the theme of the supernatural because it is the witches who initially plant these seeds of ambition, okay? So the supernatural and ambition are essentially two themes that are very interrelated because it is the witches and of course Lady Macbeth who was seen as the fourth witch who trigger Macbeth to have his downfall. They trigger him to upset the great chain of being and the divine order by killing King Duncan. So of course these two themes go directly with this quotation and of course in terms of context what you can tie contextually to this quote when writing a discussion about this is we want to always remember that these quotations illustrate the evil influence of the witches. Remember that a lot of Jacobeans at this time contextually believe that the witches were really terrible. They gave you terrible ideas once and once you acted on them, this inevitably corrupted you and it was a path of no return. Jacobeans strongly believed that the witches should not be listened to and of course Macbeth is already making his first fatal error by even starting to consider his ambition. The second quotation which I would suggest remembering and memorizing when it comes to the character of Macbeth is when he considers his vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other and this is taken from act one scene seven. Of course here we can see that Macbeth has just spoken to his wife. He is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. He wants to impress his wife by showing that he has lots of ambition uh, and that he does want to be king. Otherwise, she's not gonna see him as a man. 
but equally he wants to stay faithful to his king he knows that he might not have the qualities of a good leader he might not be able to handle the power and the influence that comes with being a king hence why he calls it having vaulting ambition this hyperbole illustrates that he himself recognizes that he doesn't necessarily feel like he can even fit into the shoes of a true ruler equally the use of personification here is this idea that Macbeth's ambition is far too great it's almost something that's too heavy to handle and of course it ties to the idiom that heavy is the head that wears a crown in other words that he realizes that this idea of becoming king of this idea of having kingship is actually something that he might not be able to handle and of course in this dramatic monologue he actually decides that he's not going to go ahead with killing king duncan okay now in terms of the themes that you want to tie it to once more you want to tie it to the theme of ambition because of course it directly ties into his ambition he realizes that his ambition might be too great for him to handle equally this illustrates um or rather you can tie it into the theme of the supernatural it is the witches and of course also his wife the fourth witch who uh, influences him to develop this ambition he, they influence him to think of himself as more than just a thing now in terms of context of course what you want to remember is this relates to the divine right of kings in other words Macbeth realizes that if he were to fulfill this vaulting ambition he would have to get King Duncan out of the way and to get King Duncan out of the way he would have to kill him and hence he realizes also another aspect of his vaulting ambition is he has to do something really cruel and terrible in other words kill the king get God angry because God chose the king he gave him the divine right to rule but equally he's going to now upset the natural order and he's going to upset the great chain of command the third quotation which to which is really really important to memorize when it comes to Macbeth's character if you're writing about him is when he has his first hallucination okay this is when he sees a floating dagger so his wife once Macbeth at first says we'll proceed no further in this business then he, his wife uh, Lady Macbeth then says well if you don't do it you're basically a coward and when you just do it then you were a man and Macbeth feels very compelled to prove his masculinity so he decides to go ahead and kill King Duncan however before he kills King Duncan he sees a dagger and he asks art thou a dagger of the mind a false creation and this quotation is taken from act two scene one when he sees this floating dagger which leads him to King Duncan's room before he ultimately kills King Duncan it foreshadows the murder of King Duncan because it can see gouts of blood on this dagger now in terms of the language analysis you want to do of course remember that him talking about the dagger being a dagger of the mind this hallucination this is metaphorical language illustrating that Macbeth is so stressed out with what he's about to do he cannot believe that he's about to kill his king and he's wondering whether this vision this dagger that he sees is something that actually is real or if it's something that's false and maybe he can still have a way out but of course he ultimately goes through with the killing now in terms of in terms of the themes the first is the theme of supernatural okay remember hallucinations also tie into the theme of the supernatural in other words the they illustrate it's uh, how um, the characters feel a strong sense of guilt and paranoia as a result of letting themselves be influenced by supernatural characters who go against God okay so this obviously ties in again to the corrupting influence of the supernatural but equally it ties into the theme of guilt we can see here that Macbeth is experiencing extreme guilt and as a result of experiencing the stress of this guilt, the stress of what he's about to do, upset the great chain of being, upset divine right of kings, he is now seeing things, he's hallucinating. Contextually, what you want to talk about is how this ties into the corrupting influence of witches, of supernatural figures. Once more, remember that Jacobeans believed that witches, if you ever listen to them, there were fiends, there were devils, and they would ultimately corrupt you and make you do really horrible, unspeakable things, like killing the king, okay? And this obviously will lead you to feel a strong sense of paranoia because you will be plagued by the terrible actions that you've done. The fourth quotation to remember when it comes to the character of Macbeth is his second hallucination this is after he betrays Banquo because he knows that Banquo according to the witch's prophecies his children will be kings so he sends murderers to kill Banquo and Flayons but Flayons escapes however he once he learns that Banquo has died but his son has escaped he then becomes paranoid and he sees the floating ghost of Banquo at his own coronation when he's being crowned king and he tells the ghost thou canst not say I did it semicolon 
never shake thy gory locks at me and this is taken from act three scene four okay so this is when he sees the floating ghost of banquo and he is horrified he's horrified at what he sees but also he's now becoming a bit of a coward because he's trying to say no no no, you can't prove you can't prove i did it right as opposed to the valiant macbeth that we saw in act one scene two according to the captain's report he never cared about you know fighting he was really brave he was able to own uh, uh, um, own up to all that he did right however we can see here that actually he's quite cowardly and this is emphasized through the use of caesura which is a structural point but equally it's emphasized through this imperative sentence he is so terrified he's speaking in commands to this ghost he wants to try and cover up his terrible actions in terms of the themes once more this hallucination this is his second hallucination represents his guilt he realizes he's starting to feel paranoid but he's also feeling guilty about killing banquo equally this ties in of course to the theme of the supernatural because he's seeing things and ghosts that are not really there okay and in terms of context you can argue that contextually the appearance of banquo the man who he betrayed for power represents uh, and rather his vision of banquo this hallucination represents punishment from god god has sent this hallucination this um uh, ongoing kind of scary ghost that appears and then disappears and then reappears it's been sent to Macbeth as a punishment directly from God who is angry that he violated the divine right of kings. The fifth and final uh, a quotation to remember is when we uh, meet Macbeth once more in that foreseen one and now he's completely corrupted by ambition, completely corrupt and he literally believes that he can control his fate. He approaches the witches and calls them secret black and midnight hags. This is in that foreseen one. Here we can see a complete change in Macbeth's character. When he first met the witches in Act 1, Scene 3, he was very terrified. He was not used to seeing these, uh, you know, creatures. He was he was a good person who worked with um, other people who respected the divine right of beings, the great chain of being and so on. However, by this stage, we can see that Macbeth has completely become corrupted by power. He wants to make sure that he can control the outcome of what happens in Scotland. And rather than focusing on being a good king, he just focuses on killing any potential rival. And the rule of three here, where he describes the uh, witch as a secret black and midnight, so the rule of three of these adjectives, is powerful in illustrating that Macbeth is quite bold but also he's very silly because he doesn't realize that the witches are just playing around with him and ultimately they're going to cast him aside and have him killed. Now in terms of uh, themes the first of course is the theme of ambition which you can tie this quotation into. In other words what this quote relates to is how Macbeth's ambition has become so great he wants to control the future uh, he wants to control his outcomes and he wants to ultimately control what happens in the future because he wants to maintain his power and his dominance as well as his reign the other theme you can tie this to is the theme of the supernatural when of course he's talking to the witches he's consulting the witches he thinks that they are on his side again here we can see Macbeth's folly he's making a mistake in his trust in the supernatural and ultimately by the end of the play when he is murdered by Macduff we realize that you can never trust witches contextually what you want to tie this to is how King James the first of England and the sixth of Scotland also distrusted the witches he distrusted them to the extent that he wrote a book called demonology where he wrote how you can spot these witches and he also argued and he was extremely paranoid of the influence of witches and of course what this uh, how Macbeth has shifted shows the way the witches can really corrupt you and make you a very depraved individual and a very terrible person and of course Macbeth is literally a shadow of his former self by the stage in the play when he is approaching the witches so as I mentioned these are the five quotations which I would suggest uh, memorizing when it comes to Macbeth. I would suggest that you also need to memorize the themes and the context points that go with them. I think when it comes to Macbeth's character, the main themes that you have to be really clear on are his ambition, of course his reliance on the supernatural, his constant feelings of guilt he's constantly plagued by guilt okay remember that once he sets off the series of events where he kills the king he then constantly has something that comes back to haunt him and he tries to control this feeling of guilt and paranoia by killing more but this ultimately and eventually catches up with him so that's really it when it comes to how to do detailed analysis on these quotations and of course what to remember for Macbeth's character